Okay, guys, this is going to build off what we talked about yesterday, and we're going to take a look at the new technologies in the war as well as the early days. Lincoln is fighting a totally new kind of war, and his southern adversaries just don't get it. A packed train speeds on its way south, ready to replenish the Union Army with fresh troops and supplies. Lieutenant George Benedict writes home. We were stowed away in freight cars and started out of the city. The train took 600 other troops besides our regiment and numbered 34 heavily loaded cars. The railroad, one of Lincoln's hidden weapons in this war. In one key operation ordered directly by the president, 25,000 fresh troops are sent on a 1,200-mile journey to the south. By road, it would take over two months. By rail, it will take these men just seven days. Following its introduction in the 1830s, America's rail infrastructure has gradually spread its tentacles across the country. Lincoln realizes it can revolutionize the speed of troop deployments. He strikes a deal with the rail owners, put the North's railroad network under government control. It turns the railroad into a weapon of war. Instead of armies being limited to the speed at which they could march, all of a sudden you had armies being able to move to, uh, to the front uh, by rail, and more importantly, supplies. Supplies and troops pour out of the north towards the battlefront. Some busy lines carry 800 tons of supplies a day, the equivalent of 80 railroad cars. In Lincoln's hands, the 24,000 miles of rail track in the north becomes an arm of his war machine. But the south has a far smaller network just 9,000 miles at the start of the war, and it remains under private control. In the four years the war lasts, the North adds 4,000 miles of new track to its network, against just 400 miles in the South. The invention of Morse code in 1844 turns the telegraph into America's first tool of mass communication. Quickly encoded, the basic system of dots and dashes is ideal for brief messages. Like Twitter today, it needs just seconds to send them and transcribe them. Where messengers previously took days, on horseback, over hundreds of miles, and across every kind of terrain, now, the country's 50,000-mile telegraph network, its communication is almost instantaneous. As telegraph poles snake out alongside the railroad lines, this vast country begins to shrink. It will transform the nature of this war, as information and decisions can flow backwards and forwards at lightning speed. Now, both sides were using some outdated tactics because the technology had advanced much further than the training. You had new muskets and cannons with rifle barrels, which allowed them to fire further and more accurately. This right here is the Springfield rifle musket. This was the most common Union rifle. And you're about to see the most common Confederate rifle right here, 
the 1853 Enfield, which was a British-made rifle because obviously the Union wasn't going to sell guns to the Confederacy. You also had paper cartridges, which allowed for much faster reloading, where everything was contained within this paper cartridge. This right here, the Manet ball, was probably the most devastating weapon because it allowed for greater accuracy and was very soft lead, and so it would shatter bone very easily. This crude piece of lead is the primary reason for the unprecedented levels of slaughter in this war. Invented in France, just an ounce in weight and half an inch across. Grooves on the inside of the barrel, rifling, spin the ball toward its target. The improved accuracy and range are a deadly combination. One second, everything's great. The next second, your guys, your, your buddy's head's gone. Or his arm's flying off. You don't want to know what a soft metal musket ball does when it enters the human body. On impact, the bullet flattens out. Bone shatters and splinters. Causing further damage to muscle and tissue. More often than not, the result of a direct hit, death. You also had rifled cannons you know, that fired further and were certainly deadly. And then late in the war, you have repeating rifles and then this right here, the first machine gun, the Gatling gun. But they saw very limited use in the Civil War, will be much later. But the, probably the biggest development in the naval aspect was ironclad, to actually have iron plating armored ships on the water. And they were absolutely effective there at the Union blockade, as well as gaining control of the Mississippi for the Union uh, in here. Probably the most famous battle between iron ships, and the very first battle between iron ships, was the Monitor against the Merrimack. Uh, it was a, basically a draw. Uh, the Confederacy did use some to try and break the Union blockade, but they weren't really effective. Uh, in the end, the Merrimack actually gets sunk uh, in a separate engagement there, and the Union Monitor uh, becomes the common way that these ships were made. Shifting gears now to talk about kind of the war in the East, you have a replacement. Uh, Lincoln realizes that Irvin McDowell is not a very good general, and so he replaces him with George McClellan, who no was known for his ability to train an army, but he was really cautious. Uh, he liked to have a perfect plan going forward. They kind of called him Little Napoleon because he was so good at planning and organizing an army. And he's going to face off against the Confederate commander of of the Army of Northern Virginia, Robert E. Lee. Probably the best general out of all of them in the entire war. And of course, he's fighting on the Confederate side. He was offered the Union command, but didn't get it. McClellan's plan was to fight up the James Peninsula here through a series of engagements and end up cutting Richmond off from the Confederate support. But he waited for nearly a month on more troops he didn't need, and the Confederates were able to improve their defensive position, and he's turned back in 1862. But Union troops did discover Lee's battle plan for an invasion wrapped around three cigars laying on the ground. And Lee had divided his army. And so McClellan attacked his forces on Antietam Creek, thinking finally he can catch Lee out in the open. Uh, it's a devastating battle. It's the single bloodiest day in American history in here. Casualties numbering 26,000 here. McClellan doesn't press the advantage, which really angers Lincoln, but the Union does claim victory in this battle. Thanks, guys, for paying attention. Hopefully you took good notes, and we'll see you tomorrow.